Today's class is uh, Capture One Pro Shooting Tethered with Sessions. Uh, we're going to build a session, outline some of the things. I'm going to take you through a slideshow really quick to talk about some of the important bullet points. This is kind of a beginner's intermediate class. We won't really be talking too much on advanced features here, uh, but kind of the let's get ready to go. How do I get in? How do I, how do I start shooting? So with all that said, I'm going to start the slideshow and we're going to, uh, we're going to jump in and have at it. All right, so like I said, today we're gonna to instruct for about 30, 40 minutes or so, and then do um, the rest of the Q&A after that. So what are we covering? We're gonna create a session with folders. We're gonna connect our camera. We're gonna switch shot folders. We'll do a little bit of live view, and we'll process a file or two. Quick recap, what is Capture One Pro? Because some of you may be new to Capture One. If you haven't used it before, what it is, is it's a fast and intuitive workflow that can be customized to fit your unique needs. It contains a flexible digital asset management on all the essential adjustment tools that you need to convert your raw file to a TIFF or a JPEG, or PSD, or whatever it happens to be. Uh, fast and easy tethering upon connection with a variety of shooting tools. And it is a whole lot more stable than a lot of the other uh, tethered shooting options that are out there. It's quicker, more stable, more robust. Uh, it is, according to phase one, built on the world's best raw processing engine. It renders precise colors in incredible detail. I can say that I have been using Capture One software for 17 years now, and um, it is my go-to default piece of software to convert a raw file to a TIFF or a JPEG. All right. Sessions, really quick, uh, where they excel. They're good for pretty much every digital tech situation that you've got out there. It's easy to manage the shoot data. It's easy to add files or data to any session because you have complete access to the file system browser. Uh, Well-defined shoots, fashion editorial, catalog job, advertising job, e-commerce, any of those kinds of things. Pretty much if you've ever been in a production studio or an e-commerce studio or house or anything like that, um, you know, it's, it, that's going to be, that's going to, that's going to be what you're using is, is, is sessions in Capture One. Uh, it's, it's just the, the self-contained uh, package that's going to have all the files in it. When you look at it in Finder, I'll show you that in a minute when we get there. Um, but, you know, the best part is you work directly on those images on that job only. Um, and it's easy to narrow in and keep, keep that order. So creating a session. When you launch the software and you open up the new session window, this is what it's going to look like. It should be familiar to you if you've tried it before. If you haven't ever tried to create a session capture one, we'll get through this uh, in a moment. So right at the top, this uh, first line right here is the session name. I always start with year first and then give it a project name that is specific. The reason I start with year first and then month and then date is because in Finder, if I have all of my stuff in the same uh, folder, be it a RAID or a, a, a network attacks, uh, attached storage system or whatever it is, um, it'll go numerically in order. And then I give it a unique name so I know what it is. Right below this is the location where it is going to save to. By default, either on a Mac or PC, it is going to be the pictures folder of your computer. You can absolutely change that if you would like by pressing the radio button. Uh, in a more advanced class, I will actually talk about case uses on why you may want to put it somewhere else. Your capture subfolder. Uh, by default, they're going to call it capture. Uh, be, and that's just kind of makes sense where you're going to put your raw files. You can change this name if you are uh, a holdover from the old days of capture one and want to change it to raw files. You absolutely can. If you want to give it a different name, you certainly can. This becomes the, the placeholder of where your shot folders should be. If you're only shooting one, one look, they can just go loose in there. But if you're doing multiple different looks per day, I highly advise putting shot folders inside of that. And we'll get to that in a minute once we get in the software. Selects folder is used to move selects to as a separate folder. It can be repurposed to fit your needs. If you tuned in for my creating sessions class that we had last week, uh, I mentioned that personally for me, for most of the work I used to do as a digital technician, uh, having the selects folder didn't really work unless I was with a still life photographer or someone who uh, definitely wanted their raw files broken out and put into a separate place. What I repurpose it for is like an outtakes folder because when you're shooting on figure fashion or an editorial or something like that, uh, more often than not, you'll have the photographer snapping a photo of the stylist walking in or the hair and makeup team walking in or they pointed at the digital tech in Fireframe or three. Uh, so I would set up my selects folder 
as a catch-all for that kind of stuff and use a keyboard shortcut so those images instantly went into that folder. So when the art director or the photographer actually sat down to edit the frames, they were looking straight at business, but that's entirely up to you. Output subfolder is where your processed files wind up. Again, all of these names can be changed if you'd like. Uh, trash subfolder is where files that are deleted inside of the session go to. Please keep in mind, this is just as um, next to being gone from your computer as the system trash is. Uh, once you put it into the session trash, and if you go inside of Capture One to session trash and hit empty, it doesn't go to the system trash like much older versions of Capture One used to. It is gone for good, so just make sure. Personally, for me, I actually changed the name on this one, so if I'm doing a finder search, I know, oh, that file's in a session trash and not in the system trash. But again, up to you how you wanna handle that part. Capture name is actually just going to pull your session name that you have entered. We can change this later. So I generally speaking, do not touch it during setup. Tethered shooting preferences. These are important to know. Um, they're in your preferences session uh, section of Capture One. So um, this is where you would find them. Uh, it's the, the fourth tab over and, you know, um, the first section is your file extension for phase one and Leaf Credo cameras. If you're not shooting with a phase one or a Leaf Credo digital back, you don't need to worry about this section. If you are shooting with one of those backs, your option is IIQ or TIF. Now, TIF is confusing because there's also a TIFF file. Earlier on, the phase raw files were a TIF uh, file extension, and it gives you the option to change to that. Uh, I can't remember the year, but phase switched to IIQ in order to differentiate. You have the choice to change here. I leave it for default. Your live view, which is the next uh, box down, this is when it's going to automatically pause during running live view. By default, it is set to 30 seconds. So here is where you can change that value. Below this is the providers that can currently shoot tethered during this session. Now, this is an important one that is uh, often overlooked. Uh, if I'm shooting with a Canon camera, I uncheck all other vendors. If I'm shooting with a Nikon camera, I uncheck all other vendors. Same thing with a Fuji or a Sony. Uh, the, the communication language that the cameras need can, to, to communicate and transmit that data can kind of interfere with each other. So it's best, unless you're working in a mixed camera situation in one session, which generally speaking isn't the case tethered, but it could be, um, I leave them unchecked and only have that one on. Keep in mind, if you are shooting tethered with a Fuji camera or a Sony camera, they are going to have settings inside of the camera in order for you to, uh, that you have to change in order for it to be able to connect tethered. And uh, the reason for this is uh, those camera manufacturers, for whatever reason, have the main functionality of the USB port or USB-C port or whatever it happens to be on the camera set as a card reader. So that way, when you take the camera home, take some pictures, you can plug it in and use it as a camera, uh, as a card reader. So you have to change that in the camera to be a, uh, to enable uh, tethered shooting communication. I don't have a Fuji on me right now to show you those uh, settings, but if you have questions on that, uh, you can always email support at photocare.com and we'll let you know what the proper setup is to make sure that the camera is going to be uh, connected. I will recommend if you are someone who rents cameras, and you rent a Sony or a Fuji, you may want to double check um, what that setting is when you get it. Don't expect it to be turned on because a lot of rental houses out there just default, the, uh, set the camera back to defaults, manufacturer defaults. So by defaults, that'll be off. So always double check that setting as well if you're in a Sony or a Fuji and wanna shoot tethered. Next up, when we get in after we've created our session, uh, this is your capture tool tab. By default, it is the second one over with the camera icon. Um, the first thing up is gonna be the exposure evaluation. A histogram will display there when you have an image highlighted. When I made the screenshot, I had nothing, so there isn't a histogram. Uh, next up is going to be your camera window, and this is where a lot of the information is. It tells me what camera I have connected, Today I'm gonna to be working with my venerable 5D Mark III. I've got the 100 macro on there. It tells me both camera and lens. Next uh, line down is our camera settings. So this tells me I am in manual mode. It tells me I'm at 125th of a second. I was at 5.6, my ISO is 100. Uh, this square box down here means I am in single uh, frame mode. 
uh, matrix metering and my mirror is currently down. I can change all of these settings just by clicking on them. Next down from that is the camera white balance and file recording settings. So currently my white balance is set to flash and I'm set to record a raw file. This is extremely helpful if you rented a camera, plugged it in and double, didn't double check its settings. And if they restored it to manufacture defaults, right here is where it's gonna tell you it's set to JPEG. So always keep an eye on this kind of stuff. The next uh, section down is where we can set white balance. We'll talk about that as soon as we uh, connect the camera and start firing some frames. Below that right here, the video camera icon is the button you click to start live view. And then you would close live view from the separate window that pops up. You need to set, do it again. You push that button again to get it going. Below that is the button to fire the camera. Now this is gonna work on pretty much every camera, uh, except for maybe some of the situations where you're using a digital back on an analog camera, like a field camera, or maybe an RZ Pro 2, but not Pro 2D, or 500 Hasselblad, depending upon which version it is and whether it has that ability to be fired from the computer or not. But if you're using your regular DSLR or mirrorless, this functionality should work. All right, this is right below that in the capture tool tab. The next section up is going to be next camera naming, uh, next capture naming. So uh, just as a quick aside, all capture one tools are going to have this question mark and these three radio buttons. The question mark is actually a shortcut to help about that specific tool that you push it from. So it launches the capture one uh, uh, help menu. And then right next to it is a radio button that actually brings up more options and is gonna change depending upon what tool we have, what it brings up. So I highly recommend taking a look at all of these things, making sure you're familiar with them. Right below this is where you control the file name as it comes in. Now you'll notice the default um, naming structure is just gonna be the name and a camera counter. And because it's still pulling the default name, I haven't changed it yet, it wants to give it the session name. This will change when we get hands-on in a second. Below that window is next capture location, which is gonna just simply tell us what, we, what folder we have our captures set to. I can browse, I can actually uh, open uh, like a finder dialog box and change it from here if I want. It's probably not the most smoothest, we'll get to what I believe is the fastest. Uh, when we start firing. Below this, it tells us how much free space is actually left on the computer. Um, so, you know, you can keep an eye on that to know that you're not gonna run out, hopefully by the end of the shoot. Below this window is next capture adjustments. This is how Capture One handles image adjustments that you set and how they apply to the next images you shoot tethered. This includes white balance, curves, levels, contrast, crop, clarity, color adjustments, etc. So this is where you would set it. And for most intents and purposes, uh, leaving it default actually is, is, is pretty much the way to go unless you're trying to do something custom. So for today, we're gonna leave that for default. We'll touch on it a little bit though. We have our live view window. So when we launch live view, which we'll do in a little bit, this is what pops up. And I've broken this out to kind of show you all of the different things that are here because uh, there's a lot going on on this box. So we have start and stop live view up top with a pause button. So as soon as you launch, live view is on and running. If you want to pause it, you can manually do so by hitting the pause button. Uh, you can take a photo through live view, uh, but what I've been finding today with my 5D3, when I do that, it doesn't actually trigger the strobe because the mirror is up. For some reason, it's not triggering it. We did not have a chance to make a phone call to find out if that's normal but uh, reach out to me if you have a question about that and I'll get you the answer once uh, Capture One Support actually gets back to me. Uh, I think that that's the way that it normally works, but I have a vague recollection of actually also having the strobe pop previous. I think it depends on the camera, but I wanted to get the right answer for you. Uh, the next one over right here is an overlay, so it'll toggle an overlay on and off. This is especially helpful if your art director or whatever you're working on, you have a layout and a ready reference that you know it needs to fit. You can actually put that overlay on in Capture One and compose and your frame to make sure that it fits. Uh, next to that is your grid on or off, and then uh, you'll notice below are the grid options. They're down here, so you can change the setup on that. Uh, we can also toggle between color and black and white. And then next to that is the depth of field tool. 
So that'll toggle your depth of field on or off. By default with DSLRs, your aperture is gonna be open and it only stops down when you take the picture. If you hit the depth of field tool, it'll close your aperture so you can see what it's actually looking like. So then below we have live view controls. With my 5D3, lightness and quality is grayed out. Uh, it's gonna depend on the camera make and manufacturer. With your phase digital backs, this is gonna be able to be set and adjusted. Uh, but with some other cameras, it is not. So it all kind of depends on what you have. Camera focus controls. Now this is only gonna work with an autofocus lens. Um, you have uh, three different buttons. So what this breaks down to is a single gear unit, um, like a five gear unit, and then I think a 10 gear unit. So near or far in either direction. So you can manually step focus the lens through. Uh, there is an AF button in the middle here. Not every lens is going to work with autofocus. So if you click it and it doesn't do anything, it might not be compatible with your camera. I actually do not have a list of what works with that. So I'm not gonna spend too much time talking about that. Below it is uh, the grid options. Again, mentioned it briefly. If you wanna put a grid on, change its color, change what size it is, all of those kinds of things, you can do that here. Um, below that, uh, you'll also notice right down here, I didn't put a little line item on it, but if you want to drop an overlay, uh, that's where you would load the overlay from just by dropping this window down. Uh, I don't have any overlays to talk about today. We've got enough to do, so we're going to revisit that at a later date. Uh, below all of that is the Live View Focus Meter. It's a tool that I'll showcase once we get in there that allows you to kind of use contrast detection to kind of... Um, help you make sure that your focus is set where you want it to be. <clears throat> you know, sorry about that. All right, once we've done, once we've set up, gone through our folders, shot a few frames, looked at live view, we're gonna come into processing. This is also a part of what we need to talk about today. Um, your processing tool tab is going to be the one with a single gear. And, you know, uh, that actually pointed to the wrong spot. Sorry about that. Uh, the radio button to bring up more options is also still here. Um, and then here is the list of recipes. By default, Capture One is going to give you a recipe. Now, the recipe contains the information and data that is going to turn your raw file into a JPEG, a TIFF, a PSD, however specifically you need that processed out. So below it are the settings. And you'll notice that this one is highlighted, checked off. And because it's highlighted, um, this is the settings for it. So I always match for the ones that I create. It, I, I match it very specifically to what the recipe is because every recipe can be as different as you need it to be. So this is an sRGB JPEG recipe, 600, 1600 pixels for web. So I know it's a JPEG, it's sRGB, it's, 600, it's 1600 pixels wide. And um, I actually made the resolution on this one 150 instead of 72 because a lot of the iPad tablet devices these days can support a little bit more resolution. So I've been kind of making my, my uh, J web JPEGs a little bigger these days. But I have all the ability to customize and control that as I need to uh, from this window and create new ones. We'll talk about all that when we get to the hands-on part of the course. Uh, if we scroll down a little bit more in that window, there's the output location, which is obviously your destination for processed files. Output naming, how the processed file shall be named. You have the ability through this tool to either add on to the name, change the name on its way out, or whatever you need to do. I haven't found a personal need in my years of doing this to have to actually change the name on output, but if that's something that you do or there's information that you add to it, uh, this is where you can make that happen and make it happen a little easier. And then below is a process uh, summary. Uh, so it just tells you based on the image you currently have highlighted and uh, the recipe you have selected how this image is going to break down. So the image that I had on screen, you know, it's a JPEG sRGB. This was the shot that it was. It's going to tell me that at that scaling size, it's going to be 14 inches by 9.33. It gives me the pixel breakdown as well, how it's scaled, the quality, and the approximate file size. All right, so now let's actually head over to Capture One and talk about this in practice because in theory it's one thing, but setting it up and running through it is what we need to do here to get you the information. So I'm gonna come over to Capture One. I am going to 
apparently lose my mouse. Hang on a second. There it is. Um, I'm going to click new session because I want to create a brand new one for today. So again, I would start with my year, the month. I actually forget what day of the week it is, the 15th. And I'm going to name it specifically tethered shooting. And again, I'm going to leave it in the pictures folder. I'm not going to bother with templates because we're not working with templates today. That's for a, a later date. Only thing I'm going to do, as I mentioned, because part of my habit is rename the trash folder so I can differentiate it from the system trash. And I'm going to hit OK. And this is going to launch uh, a new Capture One session for me. So we've got the Capture One session up. And I'm going to take my 5D3 here. And it's, I've got my USB cable connected. Got my transmitter on top, got my lens. I'm gonna put this into my tripod real quick. There we go, turn my camera on. Now, by default, we're gonna see, let's, let's actually create the shot folders before I turn the camera on. So I'm gonna switch over to my library tool tab, which is the one that looks like a folder icon. This is where I can browse my system. So I can actually come all the way down to my pictures folder and then I will browse to where my session is. Times, uh, this is actually the first time with Capture 120 I've created something, gone through my system folders drop down, and had it not pop up. Um, it does do that occasionally. All you need to do is quit the software, come back over to it, and there it is. Uh, this was something that with older versions of the software, you'd see a lot more often. This is actually the first time uh, using Capture 120 where I've seen it not automatically show this in the library view. Um, so now that I've got it, I'm in the right place. Uh, I would click on my capture folder and I would add my shot folder. So I'm gonna create a new collection, which is just Danish for folder. And I have four classic cameras that I'm gonna drop in real quick today. So I like everything to be, to kind of make sense and to follow along. So I'm gonna name my shot folders exactly what the subject matter is, because I want my shot folder to be the same as my image uh, name. And I can actually make Capture One name that automatically for me. It saves a whole lot of time, effort, energy. Uh, so I've got four cameras, so I'm gonna, Enter, see, now you'll see that as I added that in, it dynamically popped up the way I expect it to. And then for the fourth one, I'm actually gonna do it through Finder, just to show you that you can do it wherever you need to enter in from, wherever is fastest for you. So now I've, entered that into the same place in pictures, you know, into the, uh, the session folder, into the capture folder. I entered it here and it automatically popped up. Now, I'm not done yet uh, because what I want to do next is I want to add all of these folders to my session favorites. And if you were here for the sessions class, you'll remember that the reason we want to do this is because if I don't, add them to the session favorites, I can't leverage smart albums to help me narrow my focus. And also, if the software happens to crash, which it can occasionally happen, um, <clears throat> you would then have to drill all the way back down through this file section to revisit the folders to see them, set them, and add new ones. Whereas if I add them to favorites, so I just right click on the folder itself, add to favorites, you'll notice it pops up here. I've got easy access. So even when this is collapsed, I still have my shot folders there. Uh, the easiest way to do this is to utilize keyboard shortcuts. Um, keyboard shortcuts are found under edit. Edit keyboard shortcuts. And you can search to find what you are looking for. So I would search favorite. And I will see that because I have my own um, my own created uh, keyboard shortcut section, um, I've already named it and set it. But if I were to switch back to the default and then type in favorite, you'll notice that it's blank. So by default, Capture One has no keyboard shortcut assigned to this. Setting up the Capture folder is the same thing. Uh, 
set as capture folder, not already uh, named. So if you wanna make your own keyboard shortcut settings, you just hit the plus button, give it a new name, and then you can come back in and find the things that you were looking to change. So if I went capture, I can see uh, I say, set as capture folder to control C. For favorites, control F. And this allows me to change these and set them really quick. So now all I have to do is click on the folder, hit control, sorry, click on the folder, hit control F, and it automatically adds those up top without having to right click. They will uh, populate up here in the order in which you have gone down the list. So if you have a specific order you want them to be in, um, put them in that order. So they, 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 they go in order. If you want it to be alphabetical, you can do that too. Uh, that's actually how it is here right now. But if I also wanted to manually drag these and change the order around, I have the ability to do that as well. Uh, seeing as the Miranda is what is on my desk right now, we're going to start with this one. So I'm going to highlight that folder and hit control C to set it as my capture folder. <clears throat> I'm going to come over to my shoot tab again, because this is where I want to be when I'm setting everything up, names, make sure the camera's connected, my settings, all of that information. So now I'm going to turn my camera on. I'm also going to turn my light on and my transmitter. All right, it's working, hooray. All right, so you'll see, as soon as the camera connected, this window popped up. As I mentioned before, if I wanna click on any of these values and change them, you can. And it's extremely helpful for the digital tech situation. Uh, if you're working somewhere and you notice it just went from F8 to F4 because the photographer accidentally slipped uh, and bumped or whatever, you have the ability as a tech to make sure that that's good without ever even calling it out. So you can change that back here uh, so long as your, your tech is being attentive. Um, I can change any of the other things. I can put my mirror up. I can change the flash, the flash mode. I can change what file type we are recording to. All of that is here in this tool. You'll see the camera focus is below it. I have that tool in this, this window as well. I generally speaking, only use it through live view though. So I tend to collapse that one or remove that tool completely. We also have um, the camera settings. So every setting pretty much that you have the ability to change in that camera, if you come to camera settings, you can come down here and start to dial in. Um, so you can have a completely hands-off working experience with the camera if you need to do so. Say it's on a scaffolding or a crane or something like that or in a hard to reach place and you wanna change the actual physical uh, color temperature it's recording at or it's metering mode, or flash firing on or off, mirror lock, all of these things, uh, you have the ability to come in and do that straight through the software. So it's a pretty nice uh, feature to have. Below that is next capture naming. So this is where we're going to determine what the file is named as it comes in. Uh, so for this, especially if you are working on an advertising job or e-commerce or whatever, and you're given file names at the beginning and you're building your shot folders up front, um, which is how most folks typically work, you don't have to retype those same names in. Those days are long gone. Previously, when you set your capture folder, then you'd have to physically type in the name. So text would be jockeying back and forth between finder to copy and paste it back in. We don't have to do that anymore. Um, you click on the radio button that's right here, and I'm actually gonna zoom in on the software so it's a little bit easier to see most of these options. Uh, so. It always puts everything in the wrong place. Um, zoom back out a little. So here is where you change this. So we press the radio button and it brings up the naming format options. So what's in here are tokens that Capture One has give you. Tokens are going to search and pull that information and put it in for you. Um, you'll notice that camera counter is the default. Um, counting value. So it would be your image name and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as you keep going. Now, keep in mind, camera counter does not actually relate to the number of actuations that your shutter has captured. Uh, the only time it will actually relate to that is if you're shooting with a phase one uh, digital back. If you're shooting with a Canon or a Nikon or any of those things, it's going to start from one until you reset it. 
So if you happen to buy the camera brand new and use camera counter, it will, for a little while anyhow, relate to your actuations until you reset it, reset the software or any of those things. Uh, camera counter does not relate to frame count on your shutter unless it's a phase count. Uh, I generally speaking for that reason, don't even bother to use that one. I like my numerical values to be specific with how I'm shooting. We'll talk about that in a second. So we remove both of these tokens out of here. And what I'm going to do is scroll down to, um, I want it to pull the, cap the capture folder. So I'm gonna scroll down to where that is. And I think I just went right past it. Hang on. I always do this. Destination folder name. You can also choose collection name. I put an underscore in between because I don't like to have, I'm, I'm kind of hold over from when operating systems needed to have physical separation for file names and things like that. Also, I think it looks cleaner than just having space. Wholly up to you as to how you want to do it. But I put an underscore in between. I scroll back up to my digit counter. And as long as I'm going to stay under a thousand frames, I do a three digit counter. Um, that's kind of my default. I don't mess with a two digit counter. I think it looks a little ugly. And then I choose that. Now you'll notice that this automatically switched from up top to untitled to folder name plus three digit. That's because I've already saved this as a preset. But if you want to save this, say I hadn't already done so, you would click this dialog box. It would still say, you know, untitled. I would go to save user preset and then I type in the name and then I don't have to create this every single time. So now I hit go and you'll notice it changes from this sample name that it had before to Miranda because this is my shot folder. It has the camera icon on it and it is automatically pulling that information for me. I don't need to think about it. It's right there. It's ready to go. It tells me I'm going to start with frame one because we haven't taken a single picture yet. So now um, I know that's where I'm shooting to. I'm ready to go. All of this is good for where we're at. And uh, I'm actually going to open live view because what I want to do here is I want to. Uh, First, I want to focus my camera and make sure everything's good to go. Yes, you can obviously look through the camera and make that happen, but for today, I want to show you all the tools, uh, tricks, bells, and whistles. So I'm going to hit the camera icon. Maybe you heard it. You heard the shutter, uh, the, the mirror open up, and here I am. Now, because of my modeling light, I don't have a whole lot of light on this right now. And um, so for me, what I can do really quick is just come over and boost my ISO a little bit. And here I am, I'm ready to start uh, focusing. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my live view focus meter and I'm gonna put it on this M here. And you'll notice that it is mostly orange all the way to the edge, which says it's pretty close. So now what I'm gonna do is start to micro step my focus. So you'll notice if I go far with the 10 gear unit, it really starts to move and it's beyond where I need it to be. So and you'll notice that the orange lines on uh, that box are now not even there. So as I start to go near, you'll notice that the, the gray here is starting to creep towards the orange line. And as we move in, it's getting closer and closer because it's becoming more focused. So the closer you get to what the software thinks is ideal focus, uh, it's gonna be more orange the whole way through. And this is where the, the smaller steps are going to be helpful. Now, keep in mind, this is something that can absolutely drive you to a banana's level of detail. A lot of times, especially because you're wide open, uh, it's really hard to tell uh, what you're looking at. So I will do this to about as far as I think it needs to be. I'll hit my depth of field preview button, which I have turned on now to kind of see where I'm at. And all of that is falling into pretty good focus for what I want right now. I can turn that off. I feel pretty good about this. If I had wanted to turn on um, grids, you know, I can do that as well. I have all of these options. If I want to get rid of this overlay, uh, this, this live view focus meter, I just hit the button and it's gone. So now if I wanted to take this picture, what I'm going to do is turn that off, X out. I'm going to come back and make sure I drop my ISO back down. All right, there we go. So I've got my frame, I've got my strobe. Um, I can now come in, I can take a look and I can check to see how all of this is working out for me. 
Uh, if you're familiar with Capture One, you'll know uh, the, the triangle up top is our exposure uh, warning tool. Blue is going to be shadows. Red is going to be highlights. If you haven't found that tool or aren't using that tool, uh, you control its parameters via preferences. And it's, um, it's right here for exposure. Uh, for whatever reason, by default, Capture One turns off shadow warnings. Um, so this box is unchecked. Uh, highlight warnings by default are at like 250. So if you're shooting web, that's probably fine. But if you're shooting print, I highly recommend stepping that down to about 245. Uh, enable your shadow warnings, turn them on. Uh, by default, it'll be all the way at zero. So click the checkbox, pull them up. I do about 12 if I'm doing print. Um, that way I know what's out and I can check what sections are going to be possibly blocked up. I do have the ability to change these colors by clicking on the, the color palette. Uh, I've never found a need for that, but if you want to change the colors, you absolutely can. So I'm going to close this. I'm going to turn off that exposure warning tool. And so I've got an image here, uh, and then I can start working on it. So I have the ability to come in. I can, uh, oh, hey, I didn't gray balance anything. Um, so if I want a gray balance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my uh, passport color checker or whatever gray balance tool you happen to have. I'm going to stick that into frame and I'm going to take another picture. So now I'm going to hit my white balance tool right here, click on it, and that's going to neutralize the palette. I can also do that from here as well. You'll notice that I was in the exposure tool tab here. It's got a little histogram. It has our layers, white balance, exposure, high dynamic range. I chose the white balance picker from here. You'll notice it should be also checked in the top. And it is also highlighted here because that's the tool I'm currently using. So wherever you pick it from, it will be ref uh, it'll be showcased in every single one. Um, I'm being a little more verbose than normal today, so I'm starting to slip back on time a little, so I'm going to speed it up just a little bit. Uh, if I wanted to then apply some images, uh, apply some changes, things like that, if I wanted to make it brighter or darker, I do have the ability to do that using the sliders here. Uh, let me actually pull up clean frame real quick. Um, I'd say I'd, uh, you know, hard sync my B10s, but Profoto didn't give me that option. I'm having a little bit of a problem with my uh, 5D3 actually triggering the camera right now. There we go. Um, let's try turning it off and back on again. Yes, I did, and it worked. Okay, so I can utilize any of my tools here. I can pull up some highlight recovery to try and soften that down. I can add more saturation if I wanted to maybe feel some more of the blues in that metal. Uh, I can take my blacks and bring those down by grabbing those sliders. If I wanted to kind of crush my endpoints a little bit in levels, I can. Uh, any of the things that I wanted to do have the ability to do that. And then when I fire my next frame, When I fire my next frame, these all carry over because in this camera window here where I have next camera adjustment set up, I have this set to copy from last. What that means is the last frame that was in, it's going to pull all of those settings and push them forward. All right. So what I want to do next is I want to come to my contacts folder. I'm going to grab my contacts. I'm going to throw that down. I'm going to set this as... Um, my new capture folder. And then I'm not going to get to all of my cameras today, but I'll get through whatever we can. I turn on live view. I can now, you know, move this to wherever I need to have it, recompose however I want to recompose. Again, I got to boost my ISO here because I don't have enough light for my modeling lights to see anything well enough. And now again, I'm gonna bring up my meter, put this on, drive my focus. So now you'll see I was almost there and then went past. So the orange started backing off. Let's hit this one. So that's closer. I'm gonna hit my depth of field button. That all locks in. I feel pretty good about it. 
please don't judge my cameras. They are unfortunately not the cleanest thing. Uh, I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to pause this and quit out. I very much like sequencing it properly when I exit live view, pause, then quit. quit. Um, some of the older phase cameras and older iterations of the software actually would have a problem if you didn't pause and quit. It could lead to some errors or uh, things like that. So I still am stuck in that habit of doing that kind of thing. So now I have uh, changed my ISO back. You're going to notice in next capture naming, once I have moved to my next uh, folder, it's going to pick up where we left off file number wise. And there's two schools of thought on this. Some people want to know the total frames they've shot at the end of the day. They want to know, Hey, I just did this, this campaign and I shot 2000 frames. That's the easiest way to do it. I can just count those frames. Uh, some people want numerically each shot folder to start with one end where it is. And then the next folder start with one instead of a random numerical value. Totally up to you. You have the option. Uh, if you want to reset it, you punch the radio button that's in Next Capture Naming, and you can reset the capture counter from here. You can also program, program this to a keyboard shortcut. So you'll notice I click that button, contacts goes back to 001, and now it is not firing. So I'm going to do a little bit of natural light instead. Um, that is unfortunate. Uh, let me reset that picture so it doesn't look as punchy and saturated. So, you know, here we are. And if I wanted to do the same thing, I can do some crop here, put my crop on. You'll notice I've got my grids and got uh, my labels still showing and it's not hundred percent transparent, but if I fire again, um, it'll take that crop and carry it over. Um, so that's how copy from last works. All the things that you add to the frame are going to go into the frame. Uh, next up, we would then come over, we would choose how we want to process this out. Uh, so it all depends on what I need at the end of the day. If I needed this as a TIFF or a JPEG, I have the ability to uh, set those up, click the appropriate checkbox, and hit process. And um, those files are going to process as a TIFF and a JPEG at the same time. Uh, and it's pretty quick, it's done already. Um, you have to have at least one thing not only highlighted but checked off if i just had this highlighted and not checked and i attempted to process right now it's not going to let me even though i have it highlighted it needs to be checked off i can also get an error message if i have it checked off but i'm highlighting a different recipe same thing it's not enabled because i'm highlighting one but not the other so i have to make sure if i'm only doing one recipe that it's both checked and highlighted if i'm doing multiple you only need one highlight uh, so what's going to happen is these are going to pop over into my queue as they are processing. They'll go there. And then um, if I pop over to my finder window, go to output, you'll see that the TIFF file went in loosely and the JPEG file went in to some subfolders. And there's a reason for this that we're going to cover in tomorrow's processing class, but I'll give you a sneak preview. You have the option to automatically subfolder things through your processing recipe through this window. We cover all that tomorrow. So now um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually jump over to uh, the Q&A. How do you turn the heart next to the folder name red? Uh, Po, let me see here, come over, turn it red. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by turn it red, Poe. Can you follow up with that? And because I mean, they're added to favorites. Um, I think they used to be red. I think in 20, they might not actually be red anymore. They just sit gray. I'm, I'm a little confused on that question though, Poe. So if you could re-answer or clarify, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, David. Can you review lens correction while using Plexi, et cetera? No, we are actually not doing that today. This is a basic class. We're actually gonna talk about that uh, next week. So I apologize, I can't get to that one today because we are actually almost out of time. Can Capture One remember naming format each time you set up a new session? Um, not really. Uh, it's going to want to go with the default, but that's why you save it as a preset and it's a quick check. This is actually something that's been asked about uh, quite a few times. It's not there yet, but because of how many other things they are adding and changing, um, I would hope uh, 
uh, that um, that they get that added soon. But no uh, photo. It is not a sticky. Um, it is not a sticky item. It's going to want to go back to the, the default every time. Unfortunately, this time. Why does yours photo is asking? Why does yours say proofing up top? So the proofing button up top is what it's going to do is it's going to enable the color space of whatever processing recipe you currently have active. Uh, that's how Capture One handles basically soft proofing. Uh, if you do not have proofing turned on, it's going to give you the RGB colors. But if you're processing for web you and you're going to process a JPEG, you're going to want to turn proofing on while you have that recipe enabled so that it is going to show you what those colors are. Uh, that's what proofing means. Hope that answers that question. Leslie, when I click AF, the image goes out of focus. Great. So some cameras do it, some don't. Uh, for whatever reason, uh, my 5D3 is being cranky and it's not working. Not seeing focus tool in live view control panel, Nikon Z6. Uh, Mark is asking, Mark, you may need to actually go in um, when you launch live view. Um, you might need to add the tool if you don't see the camera focus window. Uh, if you see the live view and the camera icon here, but don't see uh, camera focus, uh, control click in this gray space, add tool tab, and hopefully uh, add tool tab. Hopefully that should pop back up. Uh, if it does not, send me an email at support. Uh, sorry, don't add it in the gray up here. Try and click it down here, add tool, and it'll be... Uh, live view, live view um, it would be, sorry, camera focus. So collapse these windows here, click in the gray space and add it. If that doesn't work, email support at photocare.com. How do you stop cropping to carry over from image to image? So uh, photo is asking, how do you stop the crop from coming through? Uh, so if you wanted to stop it, uh, you can either take the crop off of the last frame or you're gonna have to set up a different setting for that next capture adjustments. Um, because the default is, and the thought is, you want all the settings that you have just done applying across the board. Uh, when working in high volume e-commerce stuff or advertising jobs like I used to work, uh, more often than not, uh, we'd leave the crop on as we went, but other uh, more refined editorial or advertising jobs where they weren't exactly sure the crop, um, we wouldn't crop until the end uh, and let the art director really kind of get in and do that. So it kind of depends on your situation and that's a little bit trickier. Um, for me and for most jobs, just unclick the, uh, turn, turn it off for that frame and then keep going. How, okay, Leslie, can you please review checking focus? Okay, absolutely. So to check focus, you have a couple of options here. Let me actually turn live view off. Uh, I'm going to move this window out of the way. You can't actually see it. And I need to actually collapse the control panel. There we go. All right. So with Capture One, it gives you the ability to check focus a couple of different ways. Um, my default tool that I use is the hand tool because it's neutral. It's not going to affect any changes or anything. And if I double click, it's actually going to bring me into 100%. And then I can pan around and see what my focus looks like. So that's one way to get in to 100% and look. I can also drag the, the slider for preview size here. 100%, uh, 200, 300, 400 is the max. I can come up to the top. I have a loop tool, which if I hold this down, come down to loop size, I can change its size to medium or large. I can also change its zoom. Oh, good, it defaults to 100% still. For uh, one reason or another, it used to not default to 100%, so now it's 100%. So the loop tool is just like what you think it is. It's a loop, and it is going to give you what that section you are hovering over is just, at, uh, just 100% of just that little section. What's nice about the loop tool is I can actually check focus on my thumbnail previews. So I might have one frame up on screen, but I'm kind of curious what this one looks like. And I can, sorry about that, and say I want to know what's going on over here. I can just check that over here. 
there's also a magnifying glass that allows you to zoom in and out. There is also under the details tablet, um, a focus tool that you can um, set where it is gonna track. I actually have friends who are digital techs that set up this focus uh, window on an iPad. They use a piece of software to emulate that as an extra monitor and they'll put just that window um, in an iPad so that they can continually have focus up and checking. And by grabbing this uh, magnifying glass tool is where you set what it's looking at. <clears throat> All right. All right, uh, let's see here. I Poe asks, I keep my session location on the desktop. I think I'm in the minority. What are the pros and cons to keeping it in pictures or the desktop? Um, this is a point of contention um, with a lot of folks. As a digital tech, I do not recommend putting it on the desktop. Desktop is not exactly set up as a file storage kind of place, though it kind of has become so. With operating systems being a lot more stable these days, you can get away with it. Back in the day, it wasn't something necessarily that you wanted to really run with. Uh, pictures folder is the default location because it makes sense to have your pictures in the pictures folder. However, uh, the safest place to actually put it is something that we cover in a more advanced class, but I'll mention it here, but I do not have time to go into it to set it uh, and go into why. Uh, I've actually put it in the shared folder. Uh, the shared folder because um, if you get locked out of your user, so my user on this computer is Anthony Festa, if for whatever reason that user corrupts, I can't get access to any files at all whatsoever. Uh, but if it's in the shared folder, because that is open access, uh, I can very easily get in and get that set up. Um, so that's, that's the ideal place, but we talk about that in depth later on. Uh, how to use color checker for setting white balance. So um, Leslie is asking that question. I'm sorry, I'm starting to rush folks. I've got a lot more questions open. They keep on coming in and I've got three more minutes to go. So I'm hoping I can get through everything. Uh, I'm going to pop back over to the Miranda because that's where my gray balance tool is. Um, I'm not really sure what's going on here, but I'm going to close that out. Quit. Sorry about that. Um, let's see. So if I want to gray balance, uh, what I would do is have the shot with my color, my, my color checker in, I just have the gray patch because that's all I really need. I'm not creating profiles. We'll talk about profile creation later on. That's a new thing that requires a round trip in and out, but I take my color picker from my white balance tool, or again, as I mentioned, I can pick it from here and I, um, will find my point that I want to neutralize, and that has now neutralized that image. I have the ability to go beyond, uh, but that's, it's as simple as doing that. Now, because we are set to copy from last, this is going to pick this white balance value and pull it across everything else. If I needed to go back and apply it to all the other frames, what I would do is I would have my frame uh, highlighted here, which is the one I start from, and then I would hit Command-A to select everything else. And now I'm gonna zoom in over here a little bit. You'll see this double-ended arrow. This is the copy and apply settings to all highlighted. So I push that button. It is showing me that just the white balance has been changed. And now I would apply that and it will set that white balance to everything else. So if you shot your whole look first, didn't white balance it and realized at the end of the shot after you had it, oh man, I need white balance. You can still totally do that providing your lighting intensity and modifiers hasn't changed. The minute you change your uh, lighting intensity or your modifiers, it is in your best interest to re-white balance because it is technically not gonna be neutral anymore uh, because you have changed light. So that allows you to get that part done. Uh, it's live, did that one. Yeah, Poe, I'm not 100% sure what you're talking about with turning the heart red. I actually believe that is an older version of the software where it is red and it has been grayed out now. Uh, I think in 12, it used to be red. I haven't seen it red in 20. I can ask, I'll get back to you. Uh, how did you reset the three digit counter for the file naming when I changed it from Miranda to contacts? Great question, David. Uh, let me get that answered for you right now. We come back to uh, the camera tab and uh, we would scroll down to, not camera settings, but this next capture naming right here. We push the radio button and right here is reset capture counter. 
and that's it. Now for, for speed, you can set this one to a keyboard shortcut as well by editing the keyboard shortcuts. Uh, so I push that and you'll notice that it goes back to 001. All right, so Raul has a question, the preset for naming capture and, ca and the one for output is individual, correct? So you need to set presets for the session. So even if you choose a save preset for capturing, uh, yet yeah, Raul, I understand what you're asking. Um, for output, you only need to change the naming on output if you wanna modify the name. If we want the name to be as we set it up as shot, don't bother with the, um, with the, with the output name. If you want to make changes to your file name, add some kind of information into it or change it completely, then that's where you would change it. Uh, but for most folks that are working, the name that you set for the folder and the image is the same thing as output. If you, Leslie is asking, if you find that the image is out of focus, how do you adjust for the next shot? Um, refocus, uh, tweak it. If you're doing a still life like this, uh, go back in, uh, turn live view back on, retweak it, and then exit live view. If you're shooting um, fashion, just you know refocus as you normally would. Uh, Mark asks, I have the photo tool in live view, but not the detail check-in. I'm not 100% what detail check-in means, but if there is a tool in live view that you are currently not seeing that I have on mine, uh, if you control click in the blank space, you can go to add tool and add any of those tools. I'm sorry to cut this one brief, but we're actually gone over time. And amazingly, we haven't been kicked out of the webinar yet because we've got an hour limit. Give me a second. Um, finder says, I have 100 gigs available, but key is C1 shows 30. How do I know which is true and how am I using your shoot to folder method? Uh, so photo is asking, Finder says they have 100. I'm not sure if you've got one or two hard drives in your computer. Uh, it depends on what folder it's looking at and how it's calculating how much space. Uh, that's one that I'd ask you to email me at support at PhotoCare and we'll kind of go through that. Uh, you're welcome, David. Kenji, so always shoot to laptop and copy backup later. Uh, Kenji is saying, so always shoot to laptop and copy backup later. Yeah, I mean, I always shoot locally and I back up as I go. Um, that's best practices. That way, as you're going, have a piece of, I use uh, Chronosync as an automated piece of software to back up as I go. A lot of my digital tech friends that are working currently are transitioning over to GoodSync. I haven't had enough time to actually sit down and run through uh, advantages, disadvantages on how it works. Uh, but I use an automated piece of software and I run a scheduler on it. So as I am shooting, it backs up as I go. Uh, I don't have to worry about hitting the button. If you don't want that uh, process running in the background, what I would recommend then is setting it up and having your destination, uh, your source and destination set up. And then after you finish that shot, hit go. But I always back up as I'm shooting because that's the best way to uh, make sure that you have uh, everything safe. Um, and everything backed up. So that's that's absolutely how I would do it. I also do not recommend um, shooting to an external drive. The reason is that's gonna slow things down and you are gonna have more points for failure between communication where the files are living. So you've got your camera, your cable, into your computer, out from your computer to a hard drive. Adding in just one more point for possible failure can leave you uh, with a possible issue. Um, so it's not anything we ever want to have to troubleshoot. I leave that, uh, as minimal as possible. It's going to be faster to shoot internal and back up than shoot through your system out to a different drive. Um, maybe at some point in the future that will change, but I like to have the least amount of points for failure as possible to kind of manage the process. Um, so with that said, um, it looks like oh, we've got one more question that I'll try to answer. Good sync. Uh, so, so there's good sync and Chronosync, Leslie. Uh, Chronosync has been around forever. It hasn't really changed other than being updated to work with the newer um, operating systems. And then GoodSync is a much newer piece of software with different uh, features and subsets. It's, I'm testing it, but I haven't, 
I know plenty of digital techs who use it. I just haven't had enough hands-on time with it to say, yeah, definitely, definitely do it. Um, you're welcome on that, Leslie. Uh, so yeah, that's focus meter not working with Nikon Z6. Uh, Mark, if you, if you can, it's a newer camera, focus meter may or may not work. It also could be the subject that you've got. It's going to be one that you can email me at support at photocare.com and I'll try and help you a little bit further because we are just about out of time today. Um, I want to circle back to this. Um, as always, uh, Capture One has a support portal, a web support portal, or you can contact uh, us at support at photocare.com. We also sell uh, Capture One licenses if you need them and can make that happen for you. Uh, our next class is tomorrow, same bat time, same bat channel. Hope that's not trademarked, I hope I can say that. Uh, we're gonna be talking about a lot more robust output file processing options. I'm gonna talk about PSDs, I'm gonna talk about subfoldering options. Uh, this will be helpful in as far as how to smooth out your workflow. Um, all right, thank you everybody for coming. I really appreciate you being here and spending some time with us today to go through these, these, uh, these, these topics. I wanna thank Manny as always for uh, being here and helping out and fielding some of the questions as we go. Uh, so again, thank you so much and I hope to see you here tomorrow. Bye everybody.